This is Floss Weekly. I'm Doc Searles. Jonathan Bennett and I will talk this week with Sri Embody of H2O.ai about democratizing AI. Totally interesting topic. That's coming up next. Floss Weekly is brought to you from LastPass Studios. Securing every access point in your company doesn't have to be a challenge. LastPass unifies access and authentication to make securing your employees simple and secure, even when they are working remotely. Check out lastpass.com slash twit to learn more. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Floss Weekly, episode 603, recorded Wednesday, November 4th, 2020. Democratizing AI. This episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Barracuda. Did you know that 91% of all cyber attacks start with an email? To uncover the threats hiding in your Office 365 account, get a secure and free email threat scan at barracuda.com slash floss. And by Linode. Simplify your cloud infrastructure with Linode's Linux virtual machines and develop, deploy, and scale your modern applications faster and easier. Get $100 in free credit when you create your account today at linode.com slash twit or text twit to 474747 for a direct link to the offer. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Floss Weekly. And I am Doc Searles, and I am joined this week by Jonathan Bennett, my co-host. Um, yeah, are you there, Jonathan? He should come up any hey, moment. Hey, Doc, there he how is. Are you today? There he is. I'm great. <laughs> how are you doing? I'm I'm good. I'm good. Um, uh, yeah, I'm good. We'll we'll get into the rest of it later. There's a lot yeah, of different things. That, this is election day. Things that we, we can talk about. Political show. We're not going to talk about it, but it it is. It is, you know, it's kind of like happy run, happy new year, depending. Um, anyway, so, uh, and you're, you are where? I, uh, oh, I'm here. I'm here in Oklahoma, right in the, right in the middle of flyover country. So, you know, everybody <laughs> wave as you go by and <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's a great place to be. Um, so, yep. so, uh, our guest today is, um, is, is Sri Ambati of H2O.AI. Have you, have you looked into this yet? I, I I've looked into it a little bit just to kind of get an idea of, of you know of what they're doing. Obviously, artificial intelligence, but uh, uh, especially when we have kind of a corporate guest like this, one of the things I always like to check is go to their homepage and see is there a place where you can actually get to a source repo? You know, do they actually have something that's open source? And in this case, yes, they do. They've got what looks to be a, a really nice open source project for be, people being able to just. Download off of this repo, you know, clone the Git and uh, get it set up and get their own little uh, AI cloud running. So, you know, the, these guys uh, seem to be the real deal. I'm I'm looking forward to, okay. to digging into some of that. That should make our audience happy. So, I we got a little bit of a late start. So I'm going to hurry up and let you know that this episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Barracuda. Barracuda is the provider of cloud-enabled enterprise-grade security solutions that protect email, networks, data, and applications. Suddenly, you have dozens, hundreds, or maybe thousands of employees working remotely, each one of them getting tons of emails every day, making them vulnerable. 91% of all cyber attacks start in an email. Spear phishing, ransomware, account takeover, conversation hijacking. Multiply that by how many employees, how many emails. One click on the wrong email can cost you money, customers, and your reputation. Barracuda researchers have seen a steady increase in the number of coronavirus-related spear phishing attacks since January, and they have observed a recent spike of 667% in this type of attack since the end of February. Get the protection you need for your company with Barracuda Total Email Protection. It includes all-in-one email security, backup and archiving, AI-based protection from spear phishing, account takeover, and business email compromise. 
an automated incident response that gives you options to quickly and efficiently address attacks, security awareness training to educate your workforce so employees can be the first line of defense against attacks. Right now, there are new attacks impersonating organizations like the World Health Organization. Attackers utilize domain spoofing and promise information relating to the coronavirus in an attempt to trick users into a phishing scam. Ensure the safety and security of your business with Barracuda. To uncover the threats hiding in your inbox, get a secure, free email threat scan of your Office 365 account risk-free at barracuda.com slash floss. That's barracuda.com slash floss. Barracuda, your journey secured. Okay, so I want to welcome our guest, Sri Ambati of H2O.ei, AI, AI. <laughs> close, close enough in the alphabet, H2O.ei. Um, uh, and their slogan is, is democratize AI, which intrigued me a great deal when I first saw it, because I want us all to have uh, our own AI. So are you there, Sri? Let's see if we can Thank you for having you. us. Oh, good! Great to great great to see you. Get great to see you this morning. Um, so, so t t give us a little introduction or a little overview before we dig down into what's meant by democratize AI, and especially, can you address my personal curiosity with this, which is I want my own AI. I'm tired of hearing about all the big companies having, and even small companies having their own AI, and I want one to take home. So, um, tell us about that. Thank you for having us. Um, for us, democratizing means making it faster, cheaper, and easier for everyone to build their own AI, to make their own AI. And we are huge fans of empowering the developers and the data scientists to be able to build models rapidly without having to uh, pay for expensive closed source software that would otherwise make it difficult for them to do experiments. Data is ubiquitous. And um, unfortunately, has been um, captured by the largest tech giants in the current ecosystem. And so if companies and, and users can use their own data and build good models to predict what is likely to happen, what are the best decisions to do, both in their personal lives as well as in their companies, that's kind of where um, H2O AI resides. We started by open sourcing uh, and building a lot of machine learning um, uh, software algorithms, scalable algorithms, and uh, building great community around our project. Eventually, that project became a mass movement. And today, uh, .ai, we were the earliest .ai domain, H2O. But I think we're so excited that almost all software is being transformed with AI. So Jonathan had a, had a had a question about your um, uh, your open source project, but I'll just jump in. I have the same question. So um, uh, if I heard you right, you're actually you actually kind of started with the open the open source project and turned that into a company, or did I did I hear that wrong? So we, I mean, the key observation for um, or motivation for the project was. Um, my, my mother had uh, been diagnosed with cancer, breast cancer, and um, the dis difference between lumpectomy and mastectomy was using a very small sample of data set because machine learning was not scaling, or algorithms, math was not scaling for large data sets. So that triggered me to go and build a software that scales and is at the fingertips of the most remote physicians or data scientists. So that's kind of um, the the kind of motivation behind how we got um, started in building H two O uh, by working very closely with statisticians, mathematicians, but being software engineers uh, at heart or compiler engineers at heart, um, we we basically started building world world class software that is available for the R community, the Python community, and runs anywhere. Um, and so that's how, that was the core motivation behind the movement. And of course, um, we were fortunate enough to attract um, attention of the customers, early customers like Netflix or PayPal. And um, and they essentially um, got us into um, building something that is um, 
more of a company. And so investors followed, followed so shortly after. I was able to attract even greater talent. And today, H2O is about 250 um, uh, folks uh, on, the, on, on, the, on the team side. But the community we serve is about more than a quarter million data scientists. And about 20,000 companies use us everywhere. And it became a necessary skill set to do machine learning. Now, the machine learning has been progressing so rapidly. In, in the early days, uh, while we were trying to make large data sets be um, modeled in, we can do a billion row trans regression in less than five seconds, right? So when you can do that kind of analysis, you can then start generating code from that and create inference engines, which is the equivalent of rule engines of the prior era. And those inference engines are embedded in other softwares so that people can react rapidly to changing data. So for example, when Brexit happened, Everybody needed to rebuild their rules, and based on kind of the uh, the determination of the of the elections, you want to change certain rules and and process um, data differently. Then you can do that without having to rebuild all the rules manually. You can use AI to auto generate many of those decisions in your software. So long end of story. Long story short, we are in the business of creating software from data. It's kind of like a compiler that takes data and produces a bunch of inference engines or scoring engines. Now, such a compiler deserves to be in the open source because that's the most widely easiest way to distribute and get a core community to be working uh, in, 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 in that moment. But also it gives the most freedom to the end user, to the developer and the companies that are adopting AI. The companies that are adopting AI face a, a direct competition from the tech giants because all the tech giants are steadily moving into the verticals that they are in. And so we think of ourselves as the democratizing force uh, with the incredible talent we attracted. We're able to build a, a great high-grade software and a great uh, data science uh, automatic machine learning uh, platform and an AI cloud platform that allows for that continuous, uh, continuously learning containers that are needed to react at the, at the rate at the world is changing today. Hey, Sri, I want to jump in and uh, and ask, is this is your platform based on one of the existing uh, machine learning engines, like, say, TensorFlow or one of the other ones, or have you guys kind of built this up from scratch? We, we, we built it from scratch, and we started the project about the same time when Google Brain started TensorFlow. But TensorFlow took a little longer to choose open source. We chose open source um, from the get-go and started building a lot of community. We started building deep learning um, in our own uh, framework for transactional data, uh, IID, and time series data. And TensorFlow and PyTorch started looking at more of the web scale data and came to the same problem. But we started looking at our customers and essentially building the algorithms that solve, um, for, for example, fraud prevention or underwriting uh, credit scoring, uh, ma marketing use cases. So we started looking at use cases that matter for our user base and started building the algorithms that matter for them. And in 2015, we continued to make huge leaps in open source adoption of our platform. And that made that forced TensorFlow, PyTorch, and MXNet and all the other platforms to then get into open source. So we, we think that our view of the AI movement is that it is so important, it needs to be open. And, and that uh, set, the, set the path for it. Now, if you go one step further, the next layer, which I call the compiler for uh, machine learning, AutoML, we actually embrace uh, TensorFlow, we embrace Torch, we embrace like GBM, XGPOS. So we brought a best of breed and H2O of all the open source platforms and automatically match data and the problem you're solving with the right method and the algorithm framework you need. Of course, in addition to tuning the models automatically and building uh, the scoring engines. So the, the net net is that in our next wave of platforms, we've embraced all the open source that's happening uh, and built a very uh, solid platform that can give both uh, time to market is really fast, but also give trust on the models through explainability. We, we brought a lot of transparency and the open source nature of the frameworks allows customers to see what exactly is going into production and build some trust and interpret why those decisions are being made by the AI.
So to answer your question, we 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 pushed for an open source wave uh, for AI, and we are so fortunate that the community responded. And then we also are fortunate that Google, Microsoft, and uh, Facebook and others also threw in their um, platforms into open source. And so we embraced that and created even bigger um, uh, bigger hole. Uh, so I'm curious. There seems to be two two kind of different uh, problem sets that AI could be thrown at, and one of them is kind of real time processing, and the other one is uh, I, I'm not sure what we would call it, but you know slower processing where you have you have minutes, you have maybe hours to try to churn through a problem. Which which uh, which of those problem sets is H2O uh, really pointed at? Is it more real time processing or is it uh, is it on the disk processing? Uh, it's a good one. So, the um, so some of our scoring engines, right, the low inference, um, that takes about um, um, ninety nanos for a single score on um, the H two O scoring engines. Um, and maybe if you um, essentially build lots of these models, lots of each tree decision, we try to build the scoring engines in a way that you fit, fit in L one L two cache lines, so they don't have to evict even from cache line to do a score. But that means that you can do hundreds of models in half a millisecond, right? Sort of so, um, so you can actually now try to personalize content for your end users because you have enough profiles of, for a for a different um, for different uh, consequence, uh, consequences in the data patterns. Now that's the scoring side of the situation where it's real time more or less. Then there is also online learning. As the data is changing, you want to adapt the patterns. And we have more methods that do online learning. And then there is batch modeling and batch scoring, which is kind of where you talk about more minutes, days. Typical modeling takes sometimes um, weeks um, to build. And then the deployment takes close to six to nine months in the largest banks. And in these places, you want to be more careful uh, and look at different scenarios, simulate different things before, before making a call. And I think... Um, it really boils down to if you're making addition all the time, uh, it's a continuous addition making system, um, and it's the consequences of the addition are not very high. You can always unwind those additions. So uh, those additions you want speed and low cost uh, for modeling. Then there is the billion dollar additions or even much larger consequence additions where you cannot unwind from. Those additions you want to take the most amount of time, most amount of software and hardware and data and alternative data sets to bring to the table. Those sessions you want to spend, you're willing to spend uh, a, a large chunk of, chunk of dollars to make sure those sessions are done right. So it's the dollars per sessions and are the, is the outcome value of the session very large? Uh, then you want to, for example, anti-money laundering. Um, there uh, you, you could get fined hundreds of millions of dollars or lose reputation as a bank. There you want to apply the, the best um, uh, software to do the uh, to kind of take more time to build those models. Now, it's nothing. Uh, H2O itself is fast, and um, so it can do. It's it's the world's fastest uh, modeling environment for gradient boosting or, or generalized linear methods. And so, uh, there's nothing inherent in it that is either slow uh, that it, that makes it either batch or real time. It's it's able to deal with both um, sequences. It's just how, what problem you want to apply, and how much data you want to model to, to learn that um, particular uh, decision. I'm, I'm going to keep uh, referencing TensorFlow because it's the, it's the AI platform that I'm most familiar with. So on TensorFlow, especially when you want to do real-time processing, for the longest time, you had to have an NVIDIA GPU because they built some of their platform on top of NVIDIA's CUDA. And so if you happen to be you know, one of us over on Team AMD, you were just out of luck for being able to use TensorFlow. And so I'm curious, what are kind of the, the hardware requirements for H2O to be able to get into the game? Do you guys... Uh, do we need to have a GPU to be able to do this? Uh, can we run on something as simple as a Raspberry Pi? Where, where does that come in at? So we have uh, some of our community members who built a Raspberry Pi uh, backend for H2O. So we, we are believing in democratizing. So we want to run anywhere, right? almost on the smallest uh, ARM processor to, um, to a GPU or a TPU or FPGA. So, so for us, we took a very platform you know, kind of neutral approach, cloud neutral approach to our um, hybrid AI cloud. 
Uh, we run wherever Kubernetes is there, for example, or clusters. But in general, the most uh, elemental H2O uh, machine learning libraries, uh, they run um, on all platforms. Um, they, use a, they use a virtual machine, so they can run anywhere. Now, um, when we embraced, uh, so around 2015, 16, we ported our platforms to CUDA uh, and started uh, experiencing the speed at which uh, GPUs and parallelism at which GPUs uh, could give to our software. And we connected, we created Project Village 2 for GPU, which eventually, today we use Rapids from NVIDIA. So we, we take advantage of the best of breed and make the decision of which hardware, which processor to use, um, which platform to use, which algorithm to use, how, how many, how deep should the trees be, how, how, how wide, how many trees do you need to have. All the decisions are made um, automatically for the end user, so they don't have to really worry about, am I using uh, my hardware to the maximum, or am I um, experiencing the best uh, configuration for my platform, for my problem at hand. So we, we embrace CUDA in 2015, 16, and today we are probably one of the best um, machine learning softwares on GPUs, but the vast bulk of our customers uses on CPUs. Um, and if the customer only has CPUs, we pick the algorithms that run better, like, like GBM does better on CPUs, versus uh, if they are using NLP and image recognition problems, you need uh, GPUs. Um, and so that's kind of the, uh, the, the, the long uh, end of that um, story. Of course, CUDA and then uh, QDNN is um, the core of that uh, deep neural networks for TensorFlow. But most recently, we're seeing uh, adoption of TPUs and FPGAs as well. L large number of our customers uh, adopted GPUs in uh, 18 and 19, and that's uh, kind of where we are seeing a lot of um, the low-hanging fruit for speed, um, speed in the in, in, in machine learning. Okay, so uh, no support for OpenCL yet. So it sounds like if if somebody wants to use a GPU, it does need to be an NVIDIA GPU. Is that is that accurate? No, we we, we actually um, tinker with OpenCL. Um, uh, so unlike TensorFlow, we are able to uh, recompile and create um, uh, create OpenCL based um, um, stacks. We are huge fans of the Threadripper architecture from AMD, <laughs> and um, and I think. Um, the parallelism you get on an AMD today matches or even um, outguns a lot of the stuff you get from traditional um, um, traditional uh, Intel and uh, NVIDIA architecture. We are, uh, we are living in a very interesting um, time where you have back, where you have three different companies producing um, um, great um, firepower for uh, under our desks. And so um, we, I think we are, we are huge fans of uh, keeping a a, a good ecosystem across. So OpenCL, we have a we have a small fork of our project where uh, people have looked at um, created OpenCL editions of of the platform, and um, we we've actually tried it at a few of our customers. All right, very good. And then I'm 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 very very curious about what uh, what exactly we can do with this. Uh, what can H2O be used for? So can we do uh, real-time audio processing to be able to get uh, natural language processing? Uh, essentially, can we build the stereotypical AI assistant and be able to talk to them? Um, can we can we feed? I, I know this is something Doc is interested in. Can we take all the data that you know we've uh, assembled over the last 30 years of life and just feed all of that into it and then be able to say, hey, I don't know, pull up a picture from my vacation 15 years ago and the AI is smart enough to get the right set of pictures. Is that kind of in scope for H2O or, or are we looking at accomplishing something different? No, I think uh, absolutely. So the way we look at it is uh, the latter, like series of images is a time series, right? Sort of, um, almost all life is time series. And so um, the way we look at um, uh, kind of uh, the problems are how do we kind of start um, doing better modeling of a given time series or a given data set? Um, and say someone is trying to make a choice which college to pick next year or how long uh, will will there be? Um, we work very closely with our customers, especially in the uh, healthcare side, to figure out uh, the first wave, the second wave, and the third wave of COVID. Um, a lot of our um, data science grandmasters work closely with the community to start building those models, 
so one can predict demand. Uh, what, uh, will my local Walgreens have Lysol uh, um, or um, uh, how much Harpic um, would it need, uh, cleaning supplies or pantries? Uh, I think just generally the way you would look at our problems we solve is we look at time series and figure out seasonality lags and predict what is going to be hot, uh, predict what is uh, the price of a product. Um, uh, if you're a small business, you can essentially um, uh, organize your supply chain better, prevent um, fraudulent attacks. If you're these days, a lot of us are spending a lot more time online. And so figuring out um, kind of which websites or which email are um, likely to um, cause um, account takeovers. Um, uh, so cybersecurity, we're seeing a lot of use cases of our platform in um, kind of uh, classic fraud prevention, whom to lend. Um, and those are the kind of questions that typically are solved using H2O. From a personal standpoint, if you went out on a, one of the uh, fun projects we help with is um, census of wildlife animals. H2O is free for wildlife um, protection. Um, and uh, and so, so when people go out, take pictures on travel uh, and then post them online, you can then do a, um, based on the data of the pictures online, you can create a census of how many zebras are there to how many uh, alliance of a particular kind are there and so on and so forth. So that, uh, or how many reticulated zeroths are there. So those kinds of uh, census building uh, historically would have taken pictures using a helicopter. We can do that with travel pictures, for example. So so our, our core theme is kind of take the best in breed of uh, NLP language problems that are being solved today, best in breed of image recognition problems, um, make those recipes accessible in open source form to our customers and our users so they can start building these models if um, we started building some small models and take those models and produce applications. So data to application, that whole journey um, where data, AI, develop, uh, AI modeling, automatic uh, modeling, and then building applications around it, that's the sequence where H2 or the middleware for AI and the app store for AI, those are the things where H2 is primarily focused on. And some of those apps are taking speech recognition and making, um, creating corpus of um, speech to text recognition and then building uh, classifiers or entity recognizers on the text. We can do OCR, for example, take all your documents, life's documents, put them into uh, into a um, into a folder and, and uh, H2O AI can build a nice entity graph and kind of start looking at what was the journey of, of the person or uh, create um, for lending home mortgages. Sometimes you want to have the latest documents. It can organize and create a very simple way to uh, make decision and underwriting easier and cheaper. So, um, so the whole, the, the product is able to kind of, our view of the most valuable AI agent for someone is not just the translation of voice to text or not just the OCR documents, but actually being a um, being a kind of a trusted agent for you for your data, so that that data is being are kind of used for the right purpose. That the right being the one the APIs you you want it to be used for. Um, most of us would probably want to uh, allow people to use our data to fight Alzheimer's or fight cancer or or, or but maybe not for um, pure advertising or pure. Um, um, uh, uh, pure uh, commercial reasons, or if they are being used for commercial reasons, you would want to be part of that growth. Mm -hmm. So AI, everyone needs an AI officer who's able to protect their privacy, but at the same time, give them enough um, ways to arbitrage and exchange their information, but in return, get back uh, something of value or, or purpose. This is almost too interesting. I'm I'm sitting. I'm actually taking notes constantly as you're talking. There's there's so much, there's so many threads we can run down. And we've got about a half an hour left here. Um, but first, I need to let you know that this episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Linode. Uh, managing your complex cloud infrastructure shouldn't be hard. Linode believes in cloud computing for all. They make deploying, managing, and scaling your cloud applications simple. Simplify your cloud infrastructure with Linode's Linux virtual machines and develop, deploy, and scale your modern 
applications faster and easier. Why do over 800,000 developers choose Linode? Well, they give you flat pricing across all 11 global data centers, intuitive cloud manager, full featured API, and they have award-winning customer support 24 hours a day, a week, 365 days a year, with no tiers or handoffs, regardless of your plan size. Think of all the things you can do. Host your website, build your app, store or backup media. It's up to you. Easily launch and enrich your developer applications, hosted services, websites, AI, and machine learning workloads, gaming services, or CI, CD environments. Launch and scale in the cloud with their virtual machines. Use your $100 credit on S3 compatible object storage, managed Kubernetes, and more in addition to shared and dedicated compute instances. Be sure to check out Linode's new YouTube channel for video tutorials, security tips, and more at youtube.com slash Linode. Bryce Adams from Metoric says, from the start, we were looking for a partner, not a provider. Some of the large providers see us only as a transaction. Linode is the kind of partner that will be with us from the start today and beyond. Whether you're working on a personal project or managing enterprise infrastructure, you deserve simple, affordable, and accessible cloud computing solutions that allow you to take your project to the next level. Get started with Linode today. Visit linode.com slash twit and check on the create account button and you'll get $100 in free credit. To find out more, visit linode.com slash twit. That's $100 in free credit when you create your account today. linode.com slash twit or text twit to 474747 for a direct link to the offer. Okay, so... Um, I have this vision, um, and as you were talking, of the data flows people have in their lives that are going to places that are interested basically not in helping them a whole lot, but in basically selling them stuff. For example, I'm thinking of um, uh, if you've got a um, uh, an Alexa thing in your house and, and you talk to that and it's listening all the time, what does it know? What does your ring doorbell know? And, and over time, how does that add up? Um, especially interested in healthcare stuff, you know, especially if you've been young a long time, like I have, you have a lot of history and that's interesting stuff that, that may be relevant to future concerns such as, you know, vision problems, hearing loss, um, um, whatever. I mean, there, there's so many things that are not necessarily of commercial use in your life, but are of life use <laughs> in your life. And, um, and, and I'm interested in, I mean, you said everyone needs an AI officer. I was thinking, yeah, I need one of those. I, I, I definitely need management in my life. That is based on being a digital being. I'm, I'm not just a physical being anymore. I'm a digital one. And I have all this, all this history and data flow and I'm not alone. There are, you know, over 6 billion of us. Um, that's a pretty big market. So I'm wondering, it seems to me like you may be in ideal position for helping developers develop these things for us. Am I 100%. wrong? Absolutely, Doc. Yeah. Um, we think of AI as a common, I mean, democratizing AI is so important because democratizing AI means you can democratize all the verticals that run on top of it, like democratizing health. We work very closely with a lot of customers in democratizing credit, and that's where the banking customers come from. But democratizing health and access to health is um, is the ability to reduce the cost of um, clinical trials, the cost of um, finding the alternative drug therapies, cost of um, of personalizing um, uh, cures for each each individual gene at a time, and uh, it's also related to the uh, the diet you have. It's related to the context in which you live, how how stressful or stress free your environment is. So the ability to capture all of that, which kind of in some sense Alexa and, and Ring and Google are trying to do today, both online and offline, I think what um, we, we think of um, is that your data belongs to you. Everyone's data is an incredible asset. It's filled with such um, richness. 
Uh, and if one can use math to understand pat patterns within individual data sets and unlock um, rare therapies, unlock rare cures, unlock discover, discover new insights on how the human psyche is working, how all humans uh, on this planet are um, can come together, not um, look only for the divisive pieces that are uh, separating them, and um, and uh, and solve common problems. Uh, the, the there's more in common um, between us, and data is that common thread. And if you use alg algorithms to get past the the divisions that we see at the at the levels above, and look in the data patterns and start. Um, kind of making um, unique um, pattern discovery where um, both from a health standpoint, for example, we work with customers um, like uh, Kaiser Hospital or UCSF or uh, United Health Group to kind of find out which who's more susceptible to sepsis, uh, who's more susceptible to flu, um, COVID. Uh, we work with uh, several of the government agencies to start preparing them for the supply chain and uh, constraints that will imposed in an environment like today. Uh, but but overall, reducing the cost of doing, um, of giving care. So then we can focus on health, not just the care. Uh, and and, uh, and overall, the, the goal for AI is to be so subliminal in every application that we are building. And we just released a new software SDK called H2O Wave, which allows data scientists to build applications rapidly in a low code environment using Python and publish those applications either on uh, any of the three clouds, Amazon, Azure, or Google, or even H2O AI Cloud. So you can essentially do what Linux did uh, 20, 30 years ago to Unix and, um, and middleware and, uh, and enterprise software now with AI, where you can essentially democratize the ability to build models that can help individuals make better choices. So, so I'm sitting here thinking, um, uh, as you're talking, that in my life and in everybody's life, there's sort of two two collections of data or two two ways of looking at data. One's a noun and one's a verb almost. That one is not what I'm buying, which is what Google and Facebook and these others are mostly interested in because that's their business model. But but what I already have, I bought a lot of stuff. I'm looking at it right now. I'm using it as, as we're talking. And and there are all these books and there's all this equipment I have around here. And there's a lot of data about me that I want to know about those things. I mean, what are other people's experience with these things? How do they break down? Um, what would I be willing to share? What would I not be willing to share? What, um, you know, what additional supplies might that need? What better communications could I have with the companies that made them that, that, are, that don't fall inside their silly CRM systems that are busy just trying to game us at all times? But at the same time, there's also these flows. I mean, the verb side is that there are constant data flows in our lives and, and, and how we live. And I was thinking about what you were saying when you said you're working with Kaiser, UCSF, United Health Group, and, and there are all of these things in addition to COVID, which is like the exotic thing that showed up in the last year, but, um, and is monstrously interesting and important and really important for all these different siloed systems to be sharing with each other. You know, how do you get the intelligence together on these things? And I know enough about healthcare, having been around it and worked with these people too, they don't have compatible systems for the most part. You know, in fact, they're all full of these Kiretsus of Toshiba plus IBM plus Microsoft in one case and, you know, SAP plus somebody and somebody else. And, and, and uh, um, not, not, not to say HIPAA, right? So and HIPAA, HIPAA, yeah, and HIPAA and there are all these things that are probably restricting data flows, right? Because that's not allowed. That's not allowed. Um, and in credit, this is a really interesting thing. I know somebody, I can't say who they are, but I know somebody who made a big purchase the other day. And in order to make the purchase, what they're doing, which they're doing with cash, they they had to fill out a finance form because the seller could only imagine finance and not cash, even though they were paying cash. <laughs> and they had to do a credit check. And the credit check was not like, this is a person who has no credit problems, but something showed up. Like, what caused that to not be the best possible credit rating for somebody who's their whole life worked to have a great credit rating? They would know, the individual would know far better than whatever Experian or whatever back end, you know, the right. seller was working with, right? So how do you, you know, it just seems to me there's so many 
I mean, you must be drowning in insights and paths that you can take here Absolutely. that are terribly interesting. Absolutely. I mean, at the onset of um, the pandemic, our first, um, and by the way, even uh, H2O being open source means you're borderless. We were actually being used in um, in China with Alipay, Apple Pay, and um, and um, kind of um, WeChat and others, and we could pretty much figure out the, the rate at which it was moving. And um, the immediate uh, um, predictions in looking at mobile data online, and this is public data, people can buy, see where cell phones are moving in the U.S., is that we could predict that the um, city uh, folks would be leaving the city and uh, de-urbanization, um, which was a which was a which was a trend, but was accelerated now with with COVID, um, because people want more space, more room, um, no more public, uh, less of public transit, more of, more of uh, personal cars. So you see automotive industry taking off, uh, mortgages and local Walgreens and WalMarts in uh, rural areas now uh, needing to. Um, stock the same things that would otherwise be in Manhattan or Chicago. Um, so you started seeing these trends. But now if you take um, the kind of um, hospitals, which you touched a very interesting topic, Hospital Corporation of America uses our open source platform and builds models across 160 of their hospitals. And for when someone shows up at the ER, how to triage, right? So uh, half of hospital fatalities are caused by mispredicting ICU transfers or not. So the, building those models across their hospitals, now you can't ship data between these hospitals, but you can absolutely ship models. And so ensemble models allow you to um, stitch these models of all these hospitals and start attacking common problems like sepsis or, um, or triage or kind of uh, operational efficiency. How long will you wait in a particular um, um, local, uh, to, in, in a hospital system when you have multi-hospital systems, um, what is the wait time and redirecting you to the right place so you can get um, treatment faster, things like that. And uh, and ability to predict um, whether someone, what is the five different stages when someone comes in, is he going to be readmitted? Is he going to be, uh, is he going to need dialysis? Is he going to need kidney transplant? All those are kind of predictions. Um, and what can I do in my life today to prevent some of these um, later um, uh, problems um, in, in health side. And, and the most valuable um, um, thing in our life is health. And health um, is the most, uh, is, is wealth in some of our cultures, we, call, we use the health as wealth. So how to protect one's health um, the best form and, and reduce, mitigate risk on that front so that um, about a, a very large chunk of bankruptcies today are happening because people uh, lose health, health and 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 healthcare is so expensive. So ability to democratize health um, is a is a theme, and we want to do that in open source. Again, there's a big, large, closed source ecosystem in healthcare. When we started, SAS was the primary analytics engine for all all. Uh, F, it was the only FDA approved software, and I was uh, laughing. What is an FDA approved software? Uh, they, they said open source uh, R or Python was not FDA approved. So then we took that up as a mission and said. H2O will have all its tests publicly available for the last three years, all nightly tests and benchmarks. And so it's not a surprise that uh, when, when I heard when, that um, uh, you tried to try our product online, we not only give you the GitHub, we also give you the test run nightly for many years because we want it to be at the same level in open source as an enterprise grade software. So hospitals and banks and other communities can uh, depend on our software, uh, just like they would depend on in a high-grade enterprise software. The democratization of credit, um, as you rightfully put it, Experian, Equifax, FICO, the credit scores are, um, are especially in the subprime 600 to 700 case, are very noisy. And so alternative means of understanding who is credit worthy, who is very um, disciplined in their um, finances, uh, that's that's kind of and graphs data using graphs of data social connections to really understand how uh, how to give credit uh, how to predict tenure um, turns out 60 65 percent of America is daily wage earners right and 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 when you're daily wage earner how long will you keep a job is going to be a determinant of how much uh, how credit worthy you are 
And those are predictions of how long um, a, nur uh, a, a nurse in ER is different from a nurse in a physical therapy. So, so ability to figure out kind of credit worthiness, tenure of these people based on um, on their past, um, on their uh, professional life and past life, and essentially making credit more accessible to someone who's going to use it to go to college and get a better job or a better life. Those are the things that can have huge impact. Lastly, I, I, would, I would point to a piece you were talking about. Self-discovery is at the heart of all intelligence, right? So once intelligence becomes um, widely av available, AI is in the business of manufacturing intelligence and redistributing it just like a simple package, just like it was a simple tarball, right? So you created ability to package uh, and condense um, a lot of data into simple insights. So now you have AI that is continuously learning in, in, a, in a simple Docker, continuously learning containers. As data is coming, it's learning itself, um, adjusting and organizing itself. So that's great. So then what does it mean um, to be a human being is going to be at question. And a human being is someone with empathy who's able to kind of um, think about others as well as himself and improve himself as um, as, uh, as, as it's, it's a being, it's a process. Uh, AI is simplifying all processes and making them better. So our process of being a human is also going to be uh, optimized and we are going to be able to use our time to be more human, not just um, um, intelligent and highly organized. Hey, Sri, I'm going to jump back in. We we had a guest back, oh, it's been several weeks ago now, I'm not exactly sure how long, uh, from Red Hat, uh, trustee.ai. They were, they were looking at um, making sure that artificial intelligence decisions could be trustworthy. And one of the big things they were talking about was being able to kind of open the hood and peel back the layers and look down and see, you know, of all the different pieces of data that we gave you that goes into this, how are they weighted and what is considered the most important? And so they had, uh, they had a, a, a case where they looked into this and uh, it was a result of COVID. There were kids, I think it was in the UK, the, the school system there, um, they had an AI come up with test scores because they couldn't finish the, they couldn't finish the school year. And so they, they essentially said, all right, artificial intelligence, tell us what these kids should have scored. And when they looked into it, they found out that one of the heavily weighted pieces of data was their equivalent of a zip code, which, you know, will give you reasonably good results, except it, uh, it puts everybody in a school into a group. And so it kind of squashes the high performers and lifts up the low performers for a given zip code. And so trusty.ai was able to look into this and discover that and make some real fixes. And so the question for you is, does H2O, do, do your platform, does it come with, or do you guys, are you working on tools to be able to kind of pop the lid off the AI and look on the inside and say, oh, this is how this model came to this conclusion. And, you know, maybe that's a good thing, or maybe it's, it's I consider it cheating. Um, it, it finds patterns it's not supposed to. Uh, is it is it cheating and it's actually finding data here that we don't want it to consider? Do you guys have tooling for doing that? Yes, and um, we actually have a, a, um, um, a consortium of banks who are working very closely with us, whether it's Discover, Wells Fargo, City, Synchrony, Capital One, to create uh, standards in uh, fairness and credit, uh, especially when you do an adverse act, adverse action. Uh, giving good reason code, the right reason code. Is there, is there a column that is a proxy for race, a proxy for gender, and uh, eliminating that? Uh, models are biased because they are using data that is biased, right? So by, uh, to, and data is always biased. And, and, and so how do you kind of um, mitigate that at the stage of building the models and then uh, picking the right, building the right data, preparing the right data? If you If you put data that is, last 200 years of data for credit, it, it uh, redlining happens to be uh, a, a standard um, operating procedure uh, in the 60s, 70s. And so that data dominates um, the modeling. And so how do you kind of, um, uh, kind of create adversarial data that can kind of prevent such a, such a problem? Then, um, then comes the modeling phase. So you can pick a very complex model several layers of deep learning or a simpler equivalent of it. So we created a method called model distillation that allows you to 
get the same level of accuracy. Um, we, we built the first model using deep learning, many multi-layered perceptrons, CNNs, RNNs, uh, and the LSTMs for time series. But then we create an, uh, a surrogate model, which is far more interpretable for that same um, level of accuracy, for example. Because within the local linear um, space, you can solve it with an interpretable model. So you solve locally and fit globally. Now, if you go to the next phase, the post hoc explainability, that's kind of the uh, topic you, were, you brought up, you use methods that are game theoretic called Shapley or, or uh, kernel methods that can essentially pull out um, which, so you have two different uh, zip code and age and, uh, and kind of gender. And if these three features come up, they compete in a game theoretic fashion to figure out which of them is the most valuable, important, or most variable that is a, yeah, very that is important, and getting that kind of way of understanding. Shapley won the Nobel Prize in the 60s for that same topic of how to use, um, how to bring up the most valuable insight, most influential insight. Now, that's called the post talk explainability, and all of this is built in H2O. Um, you, you can get simple uh, dashboards out of uh, understanding disparate impact analysis. Uh, then you can play with these different scenarios and see if I took a different uh, dimension, what will happen. So uh, if if um, if a particular if if um, uh, if a per particular major event happened, what would I do next? And that kind of simulation and scenario playing and then optimization. Those are the other phases in which we also come in and help. Now all of this is math, right? Sort of so um, it's available at the fingertips, both uh, as a simple Python package or as an application or a separate customized wave application, which allows you to look at drifting of your models and automatically retrain and make the DevOps portion of the machine learning ML ops very smooth and easy. And so for us, explainability is something you need throughout the section, not just at the end of the modeling or at the beginning of the modeling, but or only at the moment. It's, it's, a, it's a continuous process. Just like you have several methods to answer the same, solve the same problem, you have several interpretations of the decision that is made. And then you pick the interpretation that makes most sense for the domain experts, that is that looks plausible, and then you tweak the business to see if that makes a difference, and then you go back again. Uh, in the specific use case of the London School and the Marcus um, uh, Goldman Sachs had a similar case uh, of, um, of being biased to a founder's wife um, uh, or not, to a founder versus his wife, uh, in one of the popular uh, problems last last year, we found that the algorithms were actually very simple. Um, it was a, it was not AI that was at fault. It was the data that was already biased that you applied very simple methods. The actual algorithms were simple linear regressions, and so it wasn't the method that was at fault. It was actually the data that was biased, and so we should constantly be fighting data to make it more equitable make it more um, um, balanced. And, and that's kind of um, the ultimate uh, challenge for us is uh, data, uh, I mean, we all know from Unix, garbage in, garbage out, right? So, but, but historical data has built-in bias in it, and we should uh, try to build models that, that fill out the blind spots that the other models have. And so having that assembly of ensemble of models that can uh, build a very robust model that is robust for minor changes in data. That's the model that will be more balanced. Okay, so we've got we've got guys in the chat room that are just jumping at the bits to play with this. Mm -hmm. And so I want to ask you, how do we get started with H2O? Let's say this will probably apply to most of us. We've got, say, a couple of Raspberry Pis kicking around and a desktop that we can put Linux on. What's the easiest path to uh, to get started and start playing with H2O? We have, uh, obviously, as you said, github.com, h2ai, h2o. We also have um, Aquarium, which is a place where people can go in, um, spin up an instance and play with and learn the tutorials. We have uh, on uh, on all the clouds, we, you're able to spin up. There is an AMI in, in, a, in Amazon. All uh, marketplaces on the cloud have our software. You can spin it up and quickly play with it. You can download on our, a page and uh, try the software and give us feedback. Uh, we have Slack channels, uh, we have uh, 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 user groups and uh, Stack Overflow. 
I uh, would love to see you. Communities are uh, how we are, we are essentially building a community of data uh, enthusiasts. Uh, we call them data scientists, you call them data engineers, you can call them machine learning uh, engineers or, um, or developers. But for us, um, we are building communities of math, physics, and domain experts. And uh, we are trying to solve big problems by using simple, um, simple Unix uh, thinking. And so we are super excited um, at, um, at, um, at being able to address your audience. Uh, for years, uh, Doc was saying he wrote at Linux Journal. Uh, Twit is um, serving such an incredible audience. Um, so we're we're we here to kind of um, um, kind of make things easier, democratize AI. Uh, our Kaggle grandmasters are building a lot of these models. Um, and Kaggle is a place where data scientists compete. Um, so we are uh, we have the world's world number one. We have the world number two, three, four. We have the top uh, grandmasters in Kaggle working at H2O. And they are usually using either H2O or other software to make AI more accessible. Uh, our purpose is to make AI uh, more trustable, more transparent, and more accessible, and uh, and cheaper and easier. And so that's the that's what we mean by democratizing AI. And we'd love to kind of um, uh, hear from your audience uh, if they try the product, and 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 from yourself as, as well. Thanks, uh, Jonathan, for trying the product, and thanks, Doc, for having us. Sure, we are we are real close to out of time. Uh, chat room wants to know where did the where did the name H two O come from? H two O is um, uh, ubiquitous. It's transparent. It's um, has very little side effects, as you know. Uh, from a philosophy standpoint, all life is um, it needs H two O, and we thought of AI to be being as ubiquitous as H two O, and we are so fortunate that the world agreed uh, that we are now today in a place where AI is part of every software. Uh, AI, H2O is needed for life on this planet, and AI is needed for life on all planets. And and then real quick, uh, this is one of my favorite questions to ask. We are we are so close to out of time. Uh, what are some of the fun or unusual or off the wall use cases that you're aware of that people are using H2O for? Oh, that's a very good one. Um, I think. Um, the, one of the fun ones, which I you know, kind of uh, was mentioning, was that uh, using H two O to to do census of um, wildlife. We've seen H two O being used to, for example, find water in um, in uh, some of the deserts. Um, figuring out where to put a um, bore well to get water itself is um, uh, is a machine learning problem. People have used that. H two O is um, used to kind of um, um, kind of figure out um, where um, to go next in terms of um, travel. Um, but I think the biggest one has been using H2O to find um, uh, vaccine for COVID. We've been, um, we've been working very closely with some of, this, um, some of the people who are fighting uh, the incredible pandemic that we're in and, and making sure that um, H2O is a software that's trusted in, with the hospitals um, today. So I think... Um, Incredibly, uh, we feel extremely privileged to be part of that um, that um, that journey. So it, it falls on me to bring this in for a landing, and um, I don't want to. This is this is too, almost too interesting. Like <laughs> I said, the, the the first thing is, um, uh, and, and as we close, we always ask: Is there any question we haven't asked that you could answer briefly? I think um, I mean Twit has built an incredible audience over the last um, 15 years. How can we help Twit um, spread the word more? For example, H2O can be an incredible partner for um, Twit and its audience. Um, so we'd love to kind of um, think of this as a beginning of the journey. So hopefully we can uh, uh, use our open source software to increase the voice that you have. <laughs> That is a very tempting pitch. I like it. Uh, the, the second is, um, is there anything you can say about blockchain? Because blockchain is our, our like our control <laughs> question in the experiment that is this show. Um, yeah, I mean AI cloud and AI blockchain, right? So those are the you can uh, couldn't go wrong with that um, combination. Blockchain is was a technology that came a little early, but it's actually a complete democratization agent uh, for data um, models uh, in blockchain will make um, scoring, for example. So essentially the delivery uh, and delivery of an AI model is a score, right? It's a simple score, whether it's a credit score or a health score or a, or a good, bad, um, 
And so that's core um, uh, models in a, in a can create an economy around themselves and blockchain would be a powerful way to do that. Um, and so uh, I, I foresee an incredible uh, dense network of intelligent um, blockchain um, based um, AI models that can um, come together as APIs that people can use and compose rich services that power the future internet. So I think uh, we, we are super excited at um, the convergence of IoT, AI, and blockchain. In 22, 23, most models will be built on the edge, not just in the cloud, um, because cell phones have uh, multiple GPUs, right? Sort of, so we expect uh, the further federation and democratization of AI, which means that you, you are with your data and with your AI model, with your insights, uh, and a simple API around it and a blockchain around it can create a very strong digital intelligent economy. Uh, and this is kind of roughly what you were uh, talking about earlier, where you try to build your own models for your own uh, in your own personal life. And if you have the best insight, um, the the future of um, the when internet started in 2020, um, people knew that there would be trillion dollar companies coming from the internet, and we have seen them. The next 10 years, we're going to see many trillion dollar uh, organizations being created with AI. The big difference would be that the AI based companies don't have to be massive. They can be a very small group of individuals who have the best AI at their fingertips and the right data and solving simple purposeful problems. Blockchain would be incredibly powerful in making that happen. Wow. And you just answered another the, one of the questions I hadn't asked, <laughs> which is just great. So uh, finally and very briefly, uh, what are your favorite text editors with your favorite text editor and scripting language? Those two things. Well, obviously, um, <clears throat> I teach uh, my kids both um, Scheme and Python, right? Sort of, um, and um, but also um, BI and Emacs, uh, of course, are um, huge wars going on. Atom is a, I love Atom um, and its variants. Um, uh, PyCharm is a good editor, um, but in when in when in a pinch, and you're on a production system, um, nothing beats BI. Well, that is fantastic. Um, uh, Sri, thank you so much for being on the show. This has been a great show, which we will highly recommend. And uh, and uh, it sounds like we have a friend of Twit as well here. So <laughs> thanks again for that. And, uh, and hopefully we'll have you back as soon as we can. Thank you for having us. And thanks for all the incredible open source uh, community that you're supporting. And um, open, source is free, open source is for freedom. And, and I think um, it's one of the uh, longest um, open source is the, one of the longest trend, long term trend uh, that is here. And I think we're super excited um, being part of that community. Thank you for having us here. Thank you. So, Jonathan, <laughs> that may have been the most active back channel we've had for a while among ourselves and with the audience. Um, <laughs> And, and th there were just so many threads that went so many directions. How did that go for you? Uh, that I really enjoyed talking to Shree. He he knows his stuff. You know, we we mentioned in the back channel. He has a an eagle eye view. He understands what's going on with you know kind of the markets in his own company. Uh, but he was also he's involved in the day to day enough that he can answer the technical questions, which we always like. Uh, we like being able to get into the technical nitty gritty a little bit. Um, we we say it from time to time. I think we could have gone another hour with him without any problems. Uh, so we we will have to wait a year or so and then bring him back on and see what's new and get into some of the questions yeah. that we missed. Uh, I I love the fact though that they're they're building this uh, this machine learning engine that anybody can grab and anybody can throw on a Raspberry Pi or on their desktop or up in the cloud. Uh, it it really does make it a lot easier to get everybody involved everybody that wants to involved in in messing around with ai and i think we'll see some interesting and unexpected things from getting so many eyeballs and so many brains uh kind of plugged into to seeing what what useful things ai can do yeah i and i, I love the i mean there's so many things i wrote down here this is one of the shows i'd love to transcribe and uh there's a one of them is how data drives software rather than the reverse that's sort of the exact opposite of the way most people think about about these things. First, I have the software, and then we do the data. Anyway, so get, give me your plug, and then we'll we'll have to get on to post production. So this has been a great 
Great. Sure. Uh, I'll plug uh, I'll plug my column over at Hackaday.com. Uh, it runs every Friday morning, and it is the security news from the week. Uh, it's stuff that's going on, whether that be vulnerabilities or, or news, new tools. Uh, you can check it out Friday mornings at Hackaday.com. Thank you so much. And thank you, uh, audience. Thank you, Back Channel. Um, thank you, everybody who digs open source that's tuned into this. Uh, this has been another Floss Weekly. Um, we'll have another great one next week. So thanks an awful lot for being with us. I'm Jason Howell, host of Hands on Android, where each week I take a look at the Android operating system and really dive deep into what it can do for you and how it can improve your quality of life, whether it be tips and tricks on how to use it better, whether it can be little known secrets that open up a world of possibilities. So many topics to dive into, including your emails. Subscribe by going to twit.tv slash HOA. We'll see you there.